Hello, I'm Jeff Richards. Uh, I'm uh, one of the trustees of the Friends of St. Nicholas Churchyard and uh, welcome to this uh, second part of a ramble around the uh, Churchyard of St. Nicholas called um, Mind Your Language. This is this is then our continuing exploration of the lives of two parish priests who, um, well, not only changed um, the English language, but they lived in a time um, when uh, there was massive change taking place within English society. I think I touched on that in the last uh, last um, uh, ramble um, two weeks ago, um, but um, everything that I'm saying here is going to be very much delving into one of the lives of one of those gentlemen um, today. That's that's a, a man called William Morland. Um, now, we can't meet in person because of uh, the the, the conditions that we're living in at the moment, this extraordinary time, uh, this historic time, which allows us to, of course, make time for history by exploring um, our shared heritage. I can do this without the encouragement of Enjoy Sutton and Sutton Civic Society. Enjoy Sutton are, of course, the 450 odd businesses that make up the uh, centre of Sutton and do so much to make uh, Sutton a great place to live and work. And the Sutton Civic Society, with their work, is a critical friend of the borough, um, encouraging a development that is sensitive and appropriate, again, helping us make Sutton a great place to live and work. Um, I'm going to be touching on aspects of uh, 15th century history, which if you want to explore uh, more about that, then I would recommend that you speak to Sutton College. They have an excellent history and culture curriculum, suttoncollege.ac.uk as well. Well, where am I going to start? I'm, I'm going to go for a romp now, um, so I do hope that uh, you're going to be able to stay with me. Um, in in the last in in the last um, uh, episode, I talked about things like bastard feudalism, uh, the idea that you had great magnates who were uh, vying to control the state uh, and their protect their familial interests ahead, really, of the monarch. And the monarch at the time, in in the time that our story is set, is Henry the Sixth, who had come to uh, the the throne when he was a mere babe and and was really rather ineffective. Um, who I want to talk about is one of those um, magnates, uh, Richard Neville, one of these great landowners with lots of, of, of Neville land um, up in the north of England. Uh, he was to become the 16th Earl of Warwick um, and he was known as, pro as you probably know, as Warwick the Kingmaker. Uh, and through marriages and inheritance, and, and he actually became Warwick through marriage. Um, at Warwick emerged in the 1450s, really at the centre of English politics. Um, originally, he was a supporter of King Henry VI. Um, however, um, he got into um, disputes with uh, other uh, other important um, uh, family called the Beaufort family. Edmund Beaufort was the Duke of Somerset. Um, and these sorts of petty human quarrels led him to collaborate, um, Neville to collaborate, uh, collaborate with uh, Richard Duke of York in opposing the king. And and from this conflict, um, he got, you know, more influence. He became captain of Calais. Uh, that meant he could control a lot of the, tra uh, the cross-channel trade. Um, he then managed to uh, enter into a uh, political conflict, which blew up into full-scale rebellion. Uh, you have a um, uh, conflict in which uh, uh, York... Uh, the Duke of York was killed, um, as was uh, Warwick's father Salisbury. York's son, however, uh, would later on um, triumph with Warwick's assistance, and he would eventually become uh, crowned as King Edward the Fourth. Um, and Edward initially ruled with Warwick's support, but it, uh, they too fell out over foreign policy and the king's choice of the commoner Elizabeth Woodville as his wife. And there was a failed plot to crown uh, Edward's brother George, the Duke of Clarence. You, you might have um, might know about the uh, butt of Malmsey sort of thing. Um, Warwick instead restored Henry VI to the throne. 
That's the sort of triumph, though, that was short-lived. We'll see about that in a moment. Uh, and eventually, um, Warwick was going to be killed at the Battle of Barnet in, in, in 1471. Now, that's the sort of great man that William Morland, the priest from Sutton, served. And, and I, I, in the previous, in previous episodes, I've talked about how William Morland had come from, uh, the, the lands, uh, that owned by Neville up in the northwest of England. So, right, right in the far northwest, um, and he's come down south. Um, he's probably been to university, but he doesn't have a degree, and so at this time he may well be in his mid twenties. If I, if we're thinking about in the eighteen fourteen fifties, fourteen sixties, it's at a time that uh, it, that he's going to be entering chancery, and from the from the fourteen thirties onwards, official records, um, which had been kept in Latin and French really start to switch over into English based on a central Midland accent but with a lot of London influence. London was London is now a sort of a city out of area. It, it, it seems to have its own geography, its own own sense of who it is. Um, the London accent is distinct from the Surrey accent is distinct from anything really and and but it draws its influence from all over the world. London was like that, drawing its influence from all over England, not just where you'd think it was from, which was Middlesex and Kent and and, and Essex. So um, you've got um, a court in London and, and the courts and, and the business people in London starting to speak English with a central Midland dialect uh, or influenced. And this these as the um, what's called the Chancery Court were, was writing and shaping English and there, there was a gradual professionalism of the Chancery where there was a lot of of training so standardization that we're going to do it this way um, and you have usages of, of where um, choices had to be made of gav um, was going to be used um, rather than yaf for 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 gave um, um, such not switch um, for such um, and uh, they are not here um, being used so spellings being changed and influencing the pronunciation as well so there's a whole lot of of work that would be the foundation of England eventually going to be really solidified in uh, by Caxton and the other printers who started to uh, come and operate within um, the lifetime of William Morland in 1476. So printers printing things and courts writing things um, develop a standardization of a language which previously didn't have the prominence because the the official languages had been French and had been Latin. Now it's a world in which there's this this professionalizing service essential to government the idea of law and you want to be able to insert into uh, the into the machinery of governance, if you are a rich and powerful man like Richard Neville, you want to start in, inserting people that you can rely on, and as they grow, you can uh, and they develop their career, you can still rely on them. Yeah, family can still rely on them. They they their patronage. You're you're doing that. So it's it's part of um. Uh, there's a loyalty beyond. Uh, your simple loyalty to your employer, the king. You also have um, you also have loyalty to the great servants of that king. So these are he, he, William Morland has started a long career in in, in about um, uh, sometime in the in, in the fourteen fifties. William Morland had risen by 1460 to be a master in chancery and we know about him because he, he becomes um, something called the deputy keeper of the Hanapa. Now that, that sounds, Hanapa is a, a variation of the word hamper. Imagine a big wicker basket. Now formerly an officer of the common law side of the court of chancery, the job of the 
keeper of the Hanaper and the deputy keeper of the Hanaper was to register all the fines that were paid on every writ of the court. And those the, these writs then had to be sealed up in bags or hampers um, and then stored to be um, afterwards opened up and issued when they needed to be. Now, um, Edward, Duke of York had come to the throne in uh, 1461. Remember, we had um, this dynastic quarrel. You have the Yorkists and the Lancastrians, and Henry VI had been a Lancastrian. Um, and um, through the through the conflicts of the Wars of the Roses, you've now got Edward, Duke of York, taking the throne as Edward the Fourth, with um, Henry VI being. Um, really sent into exile and 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 having to uh, flee around the country william morland about this time was instituted um into sutton um um really um in march um, the march of 1861 now this is a big thing for him because he he has had church appointments beforehand but uh, there's not really a sense of a, a parish with land and tithes and where he's got a an opportunity to really make a place for his family, his own family. Uh, it sounds a bit odd uh, about saying uh, a priest having family because we know about the vow of celibacy, but he has brothers, cousins, kinsmen, nephews. He wants to further his family's interests just as much as Richard Neville, his patron, wants um, Morland to work and be effective as his uh, tool really shaping policy within the crown now when william morland got into sutton and um, he, he 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 got himself on the side of the people of sutton because um, at the time there was a thomas uh, An anguin uh, or anguin was the abbot of chertsey and it may have been as early as really 1461 it may have been a little bit later but he was involved in a case brought before the Lord Chancellor over the enclosure of Benhill Common. And so he was fighting the abbot about the enclosure of, of the common land. Um, and probably this is to do with uh, access, uh, if we think about Ben Hill, this is the, the what we think of as uh, where all the trees are, or used to be, where it used to be a forested area in Sutton. Um, uh, and that Ben Hill, uh, enclosure was probably the abbot trying to reserve access to uh, the trees uh, to make sure that he had building supplies but but not actually something that was in the interest necessarily of the people of Sutton. So more, all through the 1460s this guy William Morland our priest in Sutton is involved in lots and lots of commercial deals um, He's 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 something of an entrepreneur. Many of these um, deals are in London, in and around London, and some uh, many of the people he's dealing with are fellow clerks in Chancery and other members of the Neville set. Um, and it's important to realise it is this Neville set we're talking about, um, because uh, some of the people that he has dealt with uh, include George Neville, um, who was Archbishop of York between um, 1465 and 1473 six and importantly the brother of warwick the kingmaker and 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 uh george neville will also become um chancellor of england between 1462 1467 and again 1472 71 so during the time of the um uh he was a henrikian he was a lancastrian so uh in in that type of broad politics now, in, in 1470, there was another change in the world uh, in which William Morland worked. And this was uh, something called the, the, the re-adeption or the, or the restoration of Henry VI of England to the throne of England in 1470. Now, um, Edward, Duke of York, had taken the throne as Edward IV in um 1461 so 10 years later henry had fled with lancastrian supporters uh, he spent most of that time hiding uh, in the north of england or in scotland um uh, there was still lancastrian support there 
Um, Henry had been captured in 1465 and had been brought down as prisoner into London, but um, because of the conflict that um, Henry Neville um, really was was upset with um, Edward uh, Edward the Fourth, um, and so Edward by switching sides and um, by switching his support um Warwick the kingmaker forced edward to flee in 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 1470 and and he restored henry the 6th to the throne now 1470 this is this is uh, where we are now and 1470 um guy called uh, Robert Kirkham died. Now he was the master of the roles. He was he he. Uh, William Morland knew him very well. He had done, he had he had done some deals with with Robert Kirkham. He worked with him. He's basically he was senior 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 man in the in the office, so to speak. Um, so William Morland was appointed in 1470 as uh, master of the roles. Now here he's now a Neville placeman. He's got a lot of experience, so he is a thoroughly grounded civil servant, but he knows how to make things legal. He knows how to find the paperwork. He knows and that the master of the roles is the archivist. So without the archives, or, or the control of the archives, gives you control of the narrative as well. So this is actually a very important thing. So the title of the Office of Master of Roles derives from the fact that the, this is the clerk responsible for keeping all of the roles or records of the Chancery Court. Now, actually, with, with uh, William Morland um, becoming Master of the Roles, this is the moment that gives him um, serious major kudos to be able to start promoting family members and this is the same year that William Kellett is first known about as working in Chancery so it looks like William Morland was able to use his influence to get one of his relatives that's William Kellett a position inside Chancery and and William Kellett was as well going to be the person that became priest of Sutton um, afterwards in 1488 I think it was so that's why he's important to us in this story William Kellett though um, uh, unlike though there's quite a few differences because um, although we don't think that William Morland had a degree he had been university educated and is probably the real high flyer William Kellett um, had never received uh, a university education he was something of a uh, much more of a of, of a plodder getting in there in there had to learn his trade at, within the civil service now um, William Kellett uh, no, sorry William Morland's new job gave him an official resident as master of the rolls uh, and this is actually quite a, uh, a strange little um, strange strange little benefit because uh, master of the rolls is also something uh, that was um, also known as the warden of the domus conversorum uh, which is the house of the converts uh, this is actually a building in New Street, which is now known as Chancery Lane, and it's very close to where um, William Morland did most of his work as um, Master of the Rolls, as uh, Chief Civil Servant, if you like, in the in the Court of Chancery. But the the Domus Conversorum was a home for Jews who had converted to Christianity. Now, it's, um, uh, think of it as something like a um, a commune, um, and and it's and the residents in there had uh, a stipend, or a, they didn't get the cash; they, they they just got were looked after. And it was established way back in in twelve thirty two by Henry the Third, but Edward the First, of course, expelled the Jews in twelve ninety, and it and. Therefore, staying in the Domus Conversorum was the only official way for Jews to remain in the country. And there, there were probably only about five Jewish converts living in the Domus Conversorum when William Morland used it as his official residence. Now, it was almost as if uh, William Morland didn't get a chance to um, uh, choose the wallpaper. Um, because Henry Henry's return, Henry the Sixth's return to the throne, didn't last long, um, because Edward the Fourth uh, was was actually very very good at, at 
politicking and managed to get Burgundian support and he landed in Yorkshire on um, the 14th of March in 1471. He raised local militias in the north. He managed to move down south, eventually north of London, defeated Warwick at the Battle of Barnet um, on the, uh, the month later, 14th of April. And that's when Warwick and his brother John Neville were killed and the Lancastrians uh, then uh, were also um, defeated again in the Battle of Tewkesbury. So other Lancastrians were defeated then. You had quite a lot of people dying um, at this point. You had the Beaufort family, which was one of the um, the rivals of the Neville family, more or less being extinguished. Um, Queen Margaret was captured. Um, so Edward the Fourth entered London on the twenty first of May, um, and Henry the Sixth um, died that night or soon afterwards. Um, probably on Edward's orders. This is this was a um, very serious point about the Game of Thrones. This was starting to uh, involve um, certain finality in in actions. Now Edward IV um, probably looked at uh, who had been moved into these senior positions and although there was no actual action taken against um, the priests in royal service. Henry the Fourth chose to dismiss um, William Morland weeks after his restoration, uh, and appointed actually an outsider, a man called Doctor Alcock, somebody who had a degree, um, somebody who had and and who had not been educated in chancery, somebody who had not, who was an outsider to chancery, and came into the idea that they would shake it up. Uh, and make it much more suitable for the the new York, the restored York, Yorkist regime. Now, um, all was not lost for our William Morland, though. Um, he lost the master, he lost the post of the master of the rolls, but he nevertheless managed to stay a master in chancery and hoover up other benefices. Um, and he continued his commercial deals. Um, uh, he was able to help his nephew. His I, I'm call I'll call William Kelly his nephew. I don't know what the exact relationship was, but he helped managed to help um, William Kelly become a master in chancery in in 1482. Um, he managed to get further positions. He managed to get really quite some good um, ecclesiastical positions. He resigned from Sutton um, and managed to ensure that William Kelly got that uh, role so they could continue the the surety of for their family in Sutton and those as I'll read the mill in a moment of William Morland um, but he, he he lived until uh, 1492 um, when he died and his will was proved so he got really quite a, a long life he's well into his 60s uh, really here uh, when when uh, he dies and I, I just think it's brilliant uh, that we've got so much information about uh, somebody so important within a pivotal period in 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 English history living here in in Sutton now um William Morland wasn't buried in Sutton he, he his will says to be buried in the low chapel of St Mary under the royal uh, the chapel royal of Stephen Promater in Westminster in the presence of the chapel chaplain of said low chapel of St Mary and masters John Folkes sometimes clerk of said chapel of St Stephen Benedict Burr and other dignitaries uh, Benedict Burr keeps cropping up in a lot of um it was a sounds like he was a best mate um of of uh, of William uh, now he, he goes on to talk about two volumes of manuscripts to the said chapel of St. Stephen and to the minister there for my burial and also my book called Henry Harp to Master William Kellett Clark, my kinsman, so that's our, our William Kellett, uh, my book of statutes and my register of briefs in chancery to John Chapman, my server, £10, 
to um, and I don't know um, the word there someone fill it my server 50 shillings to Robert Brown 25 shillings and 8 pennies to William Lewin Chaplin to pray for my soul 20 shillings and to Master William Kellett my kinsman for his life all my lands and tenements freehold by custom of the manor in town and parish of Sutton Surrey the remainder to Henry Morland son of Hugh Morland my kinsman and his heirs and if Henry die before William Kellett then reversion to said Hugh Morland at the death of William Kellett also all my residue to Hugh Morland my sole executor ah. I've explored. Uh, uh, I've explored in other rambles there the some of the some of the wills um, that we have. This is a an extremely well documented period in Sutton's history. We've got lots and lots of wills from the fourteen um, eighties. Uh, this is still what I would consider quite a turbulent time. But um, I he mentioned a book called Henry Harp. Now um, it's hard to tell what it means by calling a book. Henry Harp, a manuscript called Henry Harp, could actually be any one of the following. So it could be a book composed by Henry Harp, it could be a book copied by Henry Harp, it could be sermons preached by Henry Harp, it could have been a book that used to belong to Henry Harp, and it could uh, be a book containing writings by very, by various people, of whom the first or most important is Henry Harp. Now, William Morland was a lawyer as well as a priest, and so this um, could equally um, have been a book of hours, a psalter, or a textbook of laws. But those manuscripts, um, I think it's worth just saying something and ending, really, uh, our ramble with uh, going back to Shakespeare. I think I mentioned in the uh, 1450 you had um, a, a rebellion um, uh, called uh, Jack Cade's Rebellion. Well, this is this is how Shakespeare imagined this um, uh, uh, some 150 years later. This is from Henry VI, Part Two. Act 4, Scene 2. Jack Cade. Be brave, then, for your captain is brave and vows reformation. There shall be in England seven halfpenny loaves sold for a penny. The three-hooped pot shall each have ten hoops, and I shall make it a felony to drink small beer. All the realm shall be in common, and in Cheapside shall my palfrey go to grass, and when I am as king, as king I will be. All shout out, God save your majesty. I thank you, good people. There shall be no money. All shall eat and drink on my score, and I will apparel them all in one livery, that they may agree like brothers and worship me their lord. The first thing, and this is Dick the Butcher speaking, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. But Jack Cade replies, Nay, that I mean to do. Is not this a lamentable thing, that the skin of an innocent lamb should be made parchment? That parchment, being scribbled over, should undo a man. Some say the bee stings, but I say tis the bee's wax, for I did but seal once a thing, and I was never my own man since. I'm going to end the ramble there. I do hope that that's been enjoyable. Um, I've enjoyed researching this, although I, I can't promise the, um, the, the pictures and things. Um, we, I've run out of time to make sure I get all the uh, research done and, and published for today. But do uh, check out the... Um, uh, the tuition and, and the uh, the courses available at uh, Sutton College. Your history, Sutton.